Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's program. The concept of More Than a Single Story's Embracing Our Roots program came about last summer after Black Table Arts invited a small group of African-American elders to tour their space shortly before they opened. It was an honor to be there that evening and to witness how this group of young arts leaders is serving the community. At the same time, it became clear that those ascending leaders needed a greater understanding of the history of the African-American arts community. As a result, we began having intergenerational conversations between elder artists and upcoming arts leaders. In conversations with our friends David Mira and Simuk Devance, it also became apparent that ascending young leaders in the Asian American community also need to learn more about who and what preceded their wonderful efforts. My name is Carolyn Holbrook, and I'm excited to be joining forces with Cal for tonight's program, which is a continuation of their program on the Asian American Renaissance and the first in More Than a Single Stories partnership with the Asian American community for our Embracing Our Roots, Asian Americans Rooted and Rising program. Now I'd like to turn the program over to Julia Gay. She is an artist and community organizer committed to uplifting the intersections of justice, healing, and the arts. She is currently the communications and marketing manager for the Coalition of Asian American Leaders and proud host of their newly released Mini Asian, series, Mini Asian Stories podcast. Outside of the office, Julia is a dancer, a playwright, and a stand-up comedian. She was a dancer with professional company Ananya Dance Theater from 2016 to 2021, and she's currently steering committee member for the Network of Politicized Adoptees. In October 2019, Julia produced her one-woman show, Motherlanded, exploring her personal narrative as a Chinese adoptee. Learn more about her artistic work at www.juliagay.com. Welcome, Julia. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you all so much for joining um, us this evening. I know it's, well, it was sunny out before that. It was hailing out here in Minnesota. For those of you who weren't here, it was hailing in May. Um, but now we're here and I'm very happy um, to welcome you to Embracing Our Roots, Asian Americans Rooted and Rising. Uh, tonight we are diving into a conversation about the Asian American Renaissance, which was an arts organization established uh, back in the 1990s, 1992 to be exact, which means this is the 30 year anniversary of its founding. Um, we have some incredible guests here to share more about that. And before we dive into that, I um, want to give a little bit more information about Cal um, for those of you who are new to us. So Cal, or the Coalition of Asian American Leaders, is a social justice network of now over 5,000 Asian Minnesotan leaders. We have a mission to harness our collective power to improve the lives of community by connecting, learning, and acting together. Uh, we host uh, events like these um, where we get to network and connect with uh, other Asian Minnesotans and other folks around the world now. Um, and we also do a lot of advocacy work at the Capitol uh, as well as um, do different cohort programs. Um, so Katie, one of our guests was a part of MOVE, which was a leadership uh, program that we have each summer. So uh, Cal does a lot of different work and you can find more about our work at www.calmn.org um, or just ask one of us. <laughs> so yeah, that is a little bit about Cal. And I also wanted to provide a little bit more information about our Mini Asian Stories podcast. Um, so when uh, Zemukta and Carolyn uh, reached out to Cal, interested in doing a collaboration event. Um, I was really excited because um, at the same time as they were thinking about having these intergenerational conversations to share our history and really um, pass the work that has been already been done down to different generations, um, that was really a very similar conversation we were having at Cal. Um, and we, uh, this past year released and launched our mini Asian stories 
podcast, uh, which really highlights, celebrates, and uplifts voices and stories from our Asian Minnesotan community. And um, this season, uh, we just launched season two in May. Um, in part to celebrate Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and also to celebrate um, the history at the deep roots that we have here in Minnesota um, in organizing and activism. And so this season we get to talk to um, folks who have helped uh, pave the pathway for the work that Cal and so many of us are doing today. Um, so one of the guests uh, we had on our podcast was David Mora, who is here with us tonight. Um, and so we'll we'll dive into that a little bit more, but super happy to have all of you here. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce our um, our panelists and, and guests tonight. So joining me in this conversation, so we're calling it the intergenerational conversation. I'm the young person. David is our wonderful elder. So we'll start with David first, uh, though he looks uh, no older than 25, of course. Um, <laughs> so David Mora is a poet. He's a creative nonfiction writer. He's also a fiction writer, critic, playwright, and performing artist. Um, he is a third generation Japanese American and has written two memoirs, Turning Japanese, mem Memoirs of uh, Sansei, and Where the Body Meets Memory, an Odyssey of Race, Sexuality, and Identity. Um, so welcome, welcome, David. Uh, and Thank you. And so what we're going to do is we'll start with a story share um, from David, and then I will introduce um, our next guest, Katie. Um, and so first, we'll just take some time to hear from David, uh, his reflections on the Asian American Renaissance, and maybe he'll share some writing with us as well. So thank you. Welcome, David. Good to have you here. Okay, thank you, Julia, and thank you to More Than a Single Story and Carolyn Holbrook and their wonderful organization for bringing us this idea of having a dialogue between generations. And thank you to Cal, uh, our tremendous uh, activist uh, social justice organization, which now has over 5,000 members, which is just amazing to me. Um, and thank you to Julia and Katie for coming on this conversation with me and all the support staff. Um, just as a bit of context, I think, rather than the story I'll provide. In um, 1991, um, I went to the West Coast uh, because I had just published a poetry book. And I was giving readings. And I was seeing various or meeting various different Asian American artists in the West Coast. And I wanted a uh, Asian Americans here to see them. And then I was friends with Valerie Lee, who was a community activist at the time, and who, who later went on to become a foundation officer at the Minneapolis Foundation. And she, she had attended an Asian American film conference in Wisconsin. So we started talking about having a conference here. And what was interesting was suddenly other people came up to us and began, are you guys gonna, gonna have a conference? When are you gonna have a conference? <laughs> and, and, and so somehow this conversation between Valerie and I got out in the community, I don't know, really to this day know how that happened. So then we began to gather a bunch of uh, Asian American leaders, people like Valerie Elsa Batika from the Filipino American Women's Network, Carol Nayamatsu who ran the Asian American um, student organization at the U, Marlena Gonzalez, who was a, a film curator at the Walker, Nikki Tamrong, an artist, uh, Karen Tanaka Lucas, who was, uh, it, I don't know, back then, but she was uh, at a certain point head of the Japanese American uh, Citizens League, Hua Young, uh, a Vietnamese American. So we had these Asian, the, these Asian potlucks where we just sort of discussed and eventually we got together and uh, we wrote some grants and put on this conference where we had um, all sorts of different artists. We had the poets, um, Marilyn Chin, Leung Lee, and Garrett Hongo. Uh, we had the musicians, uh, great American jazz musicians, Mark Izu and Francis Wong, uh, the performance artist, Brenda Wong Aoki, 
filmmakers like Rene Tajima and um, uh, performance artists like Walter Liu. And then we had panels and this was a great success. And afterwards, everybody said, let's continue this. So then we started this arts organization. And there are a couple of anecdotes I'm gonna to refer to. One is the last day of the conference after the conference is over, we had a breakfast in my house for all the participants. And on my front porch, Rick Shiomi, uh, the Canadian theater artist, uh, was talking to Dong Nili, who is a, was, is a Korean immigrant theater artist. And they started talking about forming the theater here. And eventually that theater became Theater Move. Um, later out, out of uh, the Renaissance, um, Kathy Haddad, uh, the Lebanese American writer was a performer and uh, she eventually went on to start Mizna, which was the first uh, Arab American literary organization in the country. Uh, Mining Mua also performed in, in many of the early cabarets and she went on to form Panda Voice and um, Bamboo Among the Oaks, the first uh, or one of the first Hmong anthologies. So a lot of activities came out of, out of this, but I, I recall this breakfast that I had with the poets Marilyn Chin, the Chinese American poets Marilyn Chin and, and Li Young Lee and the Japanese American poet uh, Garrett Hongo. And Marilyn had read a, a poem which made a reference, a satirical reference to Yuan Shukai. And uh, Yuan Shukai was the first person who ruled China after the dethronement of the last emperor. If you've seen the movie, there's a point where the emperor is a young boy, a, a young teenager and a eunuch points to a car going out the Forbidden City, a limousine. And the eunuch says, that man now rules China. Well, Li Young Li told in Fort Maryland, Yuan Shukai was my great grandfather. So Li Young Li's great grandfather was a guy in limousine, you know, who became the first premier, first president of China after, after um, the last emperor was dethroned. And so Marilyn at the, at the breakfast we're having, she said, you know, Liang, back in China, you know, I come from the peasant class. My, my family comes from Toisan, I'm a peasant. You're from the upper class. We would have never met. We would never associated. We would never have anything in the common. But here in America, we're together at this table as fellow art, Asian American artists. And then she pointed to Garnai and she said, you know, back in Asia, given everything that the Japanese have done, the horrible things the Japanese have done, um, we would be uh, anticipating that Liang and I would be ha have antipathy towards you as Japanese or, or, or historical resentments. And she says, but here in America, you know, we're together at this table and we're all Asian American poets and we are discovering common bonds, common themes, ways of looking at each other's work. And I think some version of that conversation began happening with all of the artists that became part of the Asian American Renaissance is that we were discovering an, the idea of Asian American identity. And we were um, trying to promulgate the idea of Asian American arts, just not as the expression of individual artists, but as helping to form and inspire voices of the community. And we believe that by empowering people through the arts, by giving them voice, we would also be promoting social activism and the fight for Asian Americans to have a right to sit at the table, to be heard, to participate in the legislative process, to participate in, in leadership. And that, that proved to be true out of the Renaissance, this conjunction of arts and activism. So the fostering invasion of American artists, the fostering invasion of American art, the fostering invasion of American arts activism 
that was what I think the Renaissance helped accomplish in the 90s and the early aughts. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. David is just a, a fountain of so much history and knowledge. It's awesome. I love listening. Um, so our next wonderful, wonderful guest is Katie, uh, Katie Hey Leo. Did I say that right? Amazing. I just asked her and I already forgot. Katie Hey Leo. Um, and so Katie Hey Leo, she, her pronouns, um, was born in uh, Buchan, South Korea, and was raised in Indiana. Uh, her creative work explores the multiple intersections between the adopted body and notions of race, gender, place, home, and disability. Her poetry and essays have appeared in journals such as Asian American Literary Review um, and Waterstone Review, um, among many other things. And Katie, you can find more about her work at katiehayleo.com. So we'll drop that in the chat if you want to follow her and support her work. So welcome, Katie. A pleasure to have you here tonight. So thank you for joining us. And we'll give you the space um, for the next five, six minutes to share um, anything that you'd like to share in terms of the context of Asian American Renaissance and what that meant to you. Sure, thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. Thank you, Carolyn, more than a single story and Cal. Um, so when Say Mukta first asked me to join this conversation, um, I, she told me that I was going to be the baby elder of the group. And so, and that's true. I'm sort of halfway maybe between David and Julia. And I feel like I should acknowledge the fact that I was not one of the instrumental uh, founders of Asian American Renaissance, but rather just someone who's a grateful recipient and benefactor from the work um, that you all did so early uh, in the 90s. So just a little bit about me really quick. I'll tell the story and then I want to share a poem actually that I'd written um, out of some of the Miss Saigon protests that I'm sure that we'll talk about uh, later in the conversation. I grew up, like Julia said in my bio, um, I was adopted as a baby and raised in Indianapolis, Indiana and grew up in a very, very white community, um, went to Catholic schools all my life where I was basically one of like one or two Asian kids in my whole class. And that went all the way up through high school. And I really didn't have a sense of myself. I mean, as an Asian American person, as a person really as through my identity, and then certainly didn't think of myself as an artist or, um, or really an activist. I've been active in some things when I was in high school, but when I came here into the Twin Cities, I moved here uh, in 93. Um, I came up here because with a group of my friends, one of my uh, good friend's sisters was in the final year of the MFA program in acting at the University of Minnesota. And we didn't know, I didn't know when I moved here that this was kind of like ground zero um, for Korean adoptees in the whole world in Minnesota. And I definitely didn't realize that um, there were so many artists here. And I remember, going to um, one of the early uh, Asian American Renaissance cabarets. I'm not sure if it was um, around Miss Saigon or not, I can't remember, but it was at Walker Arts Center. And I remember very, very distinctly seeing uh, one of the Fong sisters, no, Wong sisters, one of the, the family that owns Rainbow uh, Chinese Restaurant, which um, I know in some of the early days of the Renaissance, they did a lot of happenings, like arts happenings um, at restaurants around the Twin Cities. And I believe it was Trin who was doing a monologue up there. And she was talking about, I just remember distinctly how angry she was. And to me, as, as, a, as a young uh, Asian American woman, I, I had never seen another young Asian American woman uh, talking about her anger and taking up space and making space for that on the stage. I've definitely never seen um, a whole lot of people who look like me anywhere, really in, in any sort of representation in media, but definitely just having that, that presence of talking and, and owning space and saying, I'm angry. I mean, it was, it was such a clarifying moment to me um, that it, it just opened up a whole, uh, I think, career path for me, a way of thinking about myself, a path to my identity as an artist, and realizing also that art could be um, 
a channel. It could be uh, an expression of some of that anger and that I was allowed to be angry and that I was allowed to feel a way about things that were going on in the world. Um, that meant so much to me. And I think just like the way that um, David was talking about identity, um, it was really, really key to my identity formation, being around other Asian American artists and other Asian people who identified with um, being Asian, especially coming as a Korean adoptee. So I'm just gonna read really quickly. This is a, a poem that I wrote and I performed it, um, I believe at the second uh, Miss Saigon uh, protest. So this is called Miss Saigon Wants a Well-Deserved Vacation. Weary, I stand on the stage of the 21st century wondering if I can go home now, used as I am like a leaf pressed into a book titled Things That Will Never Die. As the millions who fillet and consume me sing out for more and sick of their shit, I wander these counterfeit streets until they burn every last vestige of tenderness out of my limbs. On the tarmac of the new millennium, I flag down endless choppers, ask them to deliver this message. The lady would like to unsnarl herself from the barbed wire around her living room. But a boatload of gardeners couldn't dig me out of this theater. This song and dance is a crepe stuffed with saw sawdust. It's a mock duck, messed up, dressed up charade, and Miss Saigon doesn't want to play anymore. Through the hard glass of memory, I see my homeland, refracted and stretched, but nothing like this. The diamonds you think you see in this dirt are eggshells, yet you keep buying them. As for me, I'm tired of everyone searching for what they need in my mouth. Sex, love, history lesson, lightning rod, movie star. I feel old, I feel old. I want to eat my lettuce leaves rolled, but my song is just a sandwich served on the edge of a hammer. I don't want to be your moon anymore and I'm sick of smelling like orange trees. Tonight, why can't Chris die instead and I'll live a long, healthy life? As the thud of applause, reopens the wound of inventing me. I, who am wife to nothing, sister to nothing, mother to nothing, will die for nothing tonight again, and I'll wear it all like a skin. Thanks. Wow, amazing. Thank you so much, Katie. That was powerful and incredible. And for everyone here tonight, the chat is like, that's where you can send all of your love. So like, be generous, give it freely. <laughs> and um, just for a roadmap of where we're going tonight. So we've just heard um, some incredible story shares from Katie and from David. Um, I can share a little bit about my context as well. And then we're going to go into a sort of informal panel discussion with Katie, David, and I. Um, and then while you're listening, you can also be thinking up questions you might have for us as well, because we'll spend the last um, around eight o'clock, the last 20 or so minutes uh, answering any questions that you have. So it's kind of where we're going, where we're headed. Um, yes, and then um, I, yes, so, I would love to just share a little bit of context as well before we dive in. Um, so I am, I was born in the 90s. So I, uh, the Asian American Renaissance is older than me. Um, and I grew up um, in, I grew up in Ohio, um, but I was born in China and I'm a Chinese adoptee. Uh, and I found my way to Minnesota through uh, going to undergrad here. Um, and I didn't really know what I wanted to study or what I wanted to do. And I didn't really even know why I ended up in Minnesota because all I knew was that Minnesota was full of a lot of snow and horrible winters. Um, and so when I, I got here, I um, kind of very similar to Katie's experience. I uh, found myself uh, in the audience of a one woman show. Uh, it was How to Be a Korean Woman by Soon Mi Cho Met. And it was a one woman show about uh, Soon Mi's experience being a Korean adoptee and going back to Korea and finding her birth family. 
And it was the first time that I had seen, well, one, a one woman show, two, probably a, a, a main stage production that uh, had Asia, uh, Asian woman as the main character and wasn't uh, Miss Saigon. And then uh, three, it was the first time that I saw uh, my, an adoptee experience on stage and really saw myself on stage. And that was really the seed that um, got me really interested in art and started turning my wheels to the point where uh, in my last year of school, I decided to try writing my own one, one woman show and had the opportunity and honor of working with Soon Me as my director and mentor. Um, and then very full circle, I, I recently, and well, not recently, in 2019, I performed that show again at the very same theater I saw hers at uh, to an audience that had some students from McAllister where I went to school and a few of them were Chinese adoptees. And so um, very much the way that I came into this community, it the Asian American Renaissance, it was like spoken about as though it was the golden age of uh, <laughs> arts. And I didn't know really what it was, but I knew that Minnesota was special and that we had a lot of incredible artists here and that the art here wasn't just art for uh, beauty sake, but art for really pushing narratives and pushing um, conversation and making change. Uh, and I saw myself on stage so much uh, to the point where I was like, I wanna be on stage. <laughs> so that was, that's a little context. Um, I want to, uh, introduce this next section where we're going to watch a short video of some footage that was taken back in the earlier days of the Asian American Renaissance. Um, so Ryan, if you want to cue that up. And then David wants to provide some context throughout the video. And so you'll hear his soothing voice in the background uh, <laughs> as well, narrating it a little bit. So please enjoy. And whenever you're ready, Ryan, you can play the video. There I am, much younger. Uh, this, I, this Lee Young Lee. Proposed. It's only been this year that I, I've, it's dawned on me that uh, I'm not going back home anywhere. This is it. Asian Americans have to learn. There was just Katie that and another artist. If they're going to fight for justice for Asian Americans, really, it's a fight for justice, period. One of the things that's really very thrilling for me is the exciting growth of the Asian community um, in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Later on, we would have the Asian American Festival. People like you. That's Yuri Kochiyama, the great Asian American activist. To work project. Who was friends with Malcolm X. More just and harmonious world. That's the uh, Asian American parade that we had. Iji Akagawa, visual artist. When I grew up, I was going to be a writer. Jessica Hagedorn, great Asian American, Philippine American writer. Money break I have Asian American seen Asian Festival Parade. Beats in black and blue by their husbands. I have seen Asian men publicly seduce other women in front of their wives. What is home to an American-born, second-generation Taiwanese bisexual woman in a land of black and or white, 
straight and or gay? Where does one who is neither know or belong? Brenda Wamayopi, great performance artist. By the way, today is Yuri Kochiyama's birthday. My lips cut the sky's beauty in two, and I'm keeping both halves, because I am the boom crack of my heartbeat made manifest. During the Vietnam War, a very young Bao Fee. We were good fighters, having fought for freedom for thousands of years. Visions of my future are mine, which make Theronese tall. A sexy single. From the exotic Orient male. <laughs> Waiting for that special. It's Valerie song. Lee, who is the executive director of the Renaissance when it started. Yes, crown me with your love. Tonight, Asian American Renaissance brought together for the first time diverse groups of Asian dance and music. Well, it's the Asian dance company we have with many different types of Asian today, dance an Asian family and community event to honor communities within communities. Now, therefore, I, Norm Coleman, mayor of the city of St. Paul, do hereby claim Sunday, May 18th, 1997, to be Asian American Festival Day in the city of St. Paul, and urge all citizens to join us in celebrating this fabulous event. Congratulations. Wow, that was amazing. <laughs> you all look exactly the same. <laughs> wow, okay. Thank you for sharing that. Katie was like, we should watch this video and share it with folks. And I was like, let's do it. Um, so I'm really glad to also, you can feel the like, the energy of that time. And that's really what I feel like the residual energy. I mean, it's not even residual, it's just grown. And part of the reason why we're calling this rooted and rising is that it's like the Asian American Renaissance was the seed and that has grown into such a vibrant community here. And so for this next part of the evening, um, I'm, I just want to have a chance to chat with you. Um, David uh, was one of our guests on the podcast, like I said. So uh, if you check out the first episode of the second season of the mini Asian stories podcast, David shares like really in-depth history about how it all started. Um, definitely worth a great listen. And then the second episode features Marlena Gonzalez, who was uh, the one of the former executive directors of AAR. Um, and she's on here tonight. So hello, Marlena, and welcome as well. And uh, good to have you. <laughs> so uh, take a look at that. But I think right now, um, I'd love to, uh, hear from both of you. Um, so we got a little bit of context uh, about like what what it really meant to be a part of it or, and how it really started. And so I think for folks who are um, are not as familiar with the Asian American Renaissance, I think, could you provide a little bit more context of one, what it was, and then two, what it's really grown into. So like I said, I, I see it as the seed, but um, how did it start? Why the 90s? And then where has it grown from there? So that's a huge question, but take that <laughs> as you will. <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, back at that time, there were people only knew maybe five Asian American artists in town. Um, and maybe there was less than that. And, and yet I, for me, you know, I was going out to the West Coast giving readings and I had met all sorts of Asian American artists, uh, the actor Mark Hayashi, um, the playwright Philip Gotanda. Um, I think I met Brenda and, and Mark Izu who are married. Um, so I understood that there was this art being produced elsewhere, right? I mean, because a place like San Francisco has a longer history for Asian Americans. At the same time, you have to understand my generation of Asian American artists 
we were part of the first generation that was fully, say in writing, the first fully integrated uh, generation of American writers. In other words, up until then, you didn't have a contingent of Asian American writers, African American writers. You'd always had African American writers, right? But not many from the other groups. And suddenly they, we were all coming of age. And in certain ways, we were products of the 60s. Uh, so many of us had this activist mentality. And there was a challenge that started then, which is still going on, between the idea of these huge mainstream arts organizations, these, what I sometimes derisively call mausoleums to art, and the growing diversity of the, of uh, certainly the Asian American community, but the community in the Twin Cities at large. And uh, we didn't feel represented by these organizations. We didn't feel a part of these organizations. We didn't feel like there, there, there were spaces where we could be, be perform and be part of. And so just simply by forming the organization, uh, within maybe two or three years, we published a directory of 125 Asian American artists and two dozen Asian American arts organizations. Now, we didn't sim create all those artists. Some of them were always there, but nobody had really bothered to look into them. The mainstream arts organizations had not. They had not tried to find these artists, these arts organizations. And so we were able to reach the Asian American community in ways that organizations like the Walker or, or the Guthrie or the Loft were not able to do. And conversely, within the space, there were so many times when people just saw our cabaret and went, oh, I've never thought about becoming an artist. Maybe I can do that. And it's really because suddenly you saw Asian Americans on stage. And that was the same for me. I had this experience in the early 90s when I went out to the West Coast and I saw them workshop at the Mark Taper II in Los Angeles, Philip Catanda's great play, Fish Head Soup. And afterwards I thought, I'm a published poet. Why have I never thought about writing a play? And then I realized like, I'd never seen Asian Americans on stage before. And suddenly I realized like, there were these actors I could write for and actually they, they depended on me to, <coughs> to help write material from them. And so I think out of all of that uh, and uh, the activism that was going on in the time in the arts, and remember that this was also during the time right when uh, you had the Rodney King video, which was the first sentence of technology overcoming racism, really because Black people had been complaining for since 1865 over treatment by police, but white people never believed them or never paid attention to it. It was only once you had this random video in the early 90s. And so at that time also, I did a show with Alex Pate about Asian black relations and everything that had went down in LA. So that was the sort of tenor of the times. It was like suddenly we were breaking through and we were challenging the mainstream and, and the Renaissance was part of that. Um, I just want to add, and I can talk a little bit about just maybe some of the legacy um, and to build off what David was just talking about. First wanted to just show that I still have my two Asian American Renaissance literary journals, East Meets West, and then Sexual Orientations. For those of you, I see that Rose Chu is in the house, that we've got Marlena Gonzalez in the house, Sherry Kwan Lee is in the house. I mean, there are all these folks who were so key and Carissa is in the house um, to early, to um, my early development as an artist. And I feel like I didn't know that I could write. I didn't know what it meant to write as an Asian American writer too, and how to grapple with some of the issues, especially around identity, sexuality, um, you know, travel, just being in a body. And it really was because of the Renaissance that I was able to just try things. There was this incredible uh, spirit of just experimenting and all of us just showing up and just being really open. I remember working with Lily um, 
Song, I think it was, who was a filmmaker. She was a very experimental filmmaker. And sitting there in front of this table, we were just making this video and this film. And she had, she had covered with food. And I was just, and I was dressed up in like a kimono and I was eating all this food. And I didn't know what I was doing. And then every once in a while, I'd have to wrap my leg in like, ropes and then I was like spitting food out into a pail it was just this this wild thing but that's just I was anything that people wanted me to do I think that Nikkei saw me in like a, a monologue in like a new eyes festival and then she's like do you want to be in a in a film I'm making I'm gonna have you sit naked in this bathtub that I filled with ink I mean just there's just this great spirit and this feeling of just being so excited to make art and really mostly to be in community with each other and I think um that spirit of again being together is what kind of led into some of those Miss Saigon protests, um, as well as um, what eventually became the the um, Minnesota Spoken Word and Poetry Summit, which I know that we were all involved in as well in 2011. So those seeds were really planted with the Renaissance, and they continued to flower, and I think they continue to to bear fruit to this day. That's awesome. Yeah, I love that. I remember seeing, this is kind of tangential, but I remember watching Crazy Rich Asians, right? Back when it was like all the all the news and super exciting because we were like on a blockbuster film and it was very mediocre, I would say. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's okay. I loved it because I was like, this is what we need in order to get to where we can actually be our true weird, selves and creative selves on the main, main stage and main screens. And um, Michelle Yeoh's recent movie, Everything Everywhere All at Once is like that. And if you haven't seen it already, go out and see it. That's, your, that's everyone's homework for <laughs> tonight. But um, yeah, I, I'm curious because everyone talks about the coast, right? Everyone is really uh, like, when we talk about the AAPI community, um, I think that in arts, we're often thinking about California, maybe we're thinking about New York. And I don't know if like in the national realm that Minnesota comes up all that often, but I think that we all know that we have something really special here. And so I'm curious, like David and Katie, what you think um, really makes the community here unique and how have we, like in this community in Minnesota really contributed to this more broader Asian American arts movement? Um, first of all, I, I think we're more, we are more politically activists in, in this community. And I think, you know, the reasons are, are myriad. You know, certainly there are, are artists who have done activist work. There's, you know, and simply starting an organization like the Renaissance is activist work, starting an organization like Cal, starting Theater Move, right? Starting the the uh, chat, right? And I, I want to offer this challenge. I, I said this before we met before to some young person out there listening, there is still a need for an organization like the Asian American Renaissance. And if you want to get the group, uh, group of gather, uh, gather a group of people to try to recreate another organization, um, you know, please contact me and I will offer whatever help and advice I, I, I have. Um, so, but I, I think there, there are a couple reasons at least. One is that um, the communities here are, are racially are much more diverse and integrated. And by that, I mean, they're not like we all get along, right? But I remember uh, Tu Zhu Zhang at Hmong American Day shouting from the stage and he's, you know, Tu Zhu was emceeing. He goes, how many Hmong have a black person in your family? And there were shouts in the crowd. And he goes, yeah, we all have a black person in our family. He says, and we all have a white person in our family, right? And, and so in other areas of the country, people are much more segregated by group. Like you can be an Asian American in Los Angeles and, and, and not have to speak English, right, at all. You can be in a Korean community, you can be in a, a Chinese community or Vietnamese community. And here we're, we're interacting interracially in ways that um, 
you know, that don't, that, don't, that don't happen elsewhere. I think you also have to remember that during the early, late 80s and early 90s, uh, it was when hip hop was really coming on and becoming a national phenomenon and going beyond the black community. And so many urban kids of color who weren't black heard this music and went, oh my God, uh, you know, there's something in this, this anger about uh, the conditions, this anger at racism, this speaking out, this being unafraid uh, of what white people were gonna think or say, right? And all of that was very liberating, I think, to the culture as a whole at a time when you had the Korean adoptee population coming of age here, you had uh, the influx of, of, of Hmong, uh, of the Hmong population here. And between those two things, you really had the conditions to for, and the Hmong population is, people who are Hmong better know better than me, was a refugee population, which is a different population than one which is an immigrant population, which chooses to come to this country for various different reasons, often economic. When you have to flee from war and destruction and genocide, your reasons for coming here are very different and your relationship to your coming is very different. And you are steeped in certain ways in the idea of political activity. So I think, and, and I think the Korean adoptees and, and Katie can speak to that also had an effect here. Um, and then some of it is just chance. It's like, how did Rick Shiomi, a Japanese Canadian from, uh, um, I forgot the city. I'm losing. <clears throat> Not Montreal, the other <laughs> Canadian city. Toronto? But he, yeah, Toronto, but by way of Vancouver, right? How did Rick end up in all places of Minnesota? How did I end up here? I grew up in Chicago, right? It was just by chance. You know, how did Ananya uh, Chatterjee end up here? You know, it's just this chance that, you know, how did the punker and me? <laughs> <laughs> and Mina Mukherjee end up here, you know, right? It was just like, some of this is also just chance. Wonderful chance, wonderful serendipity. Yeah, and I will add just a couple stories related to what David was talking about. So I remember going to the Consortium of Asian American Theater Conference back in, I think it like 2006, it was like the early 2000s and doing a special panel with, um, Katie Kavang and a couple other folks just specifically about this idea of like the um, Asian American community in Minnesota and all of the heads of the different Asian American theater com uh, companies came to this panel and we talked specifically about what David was talking about just focusing on particularly the Korean adoptee community and also you know Hmong and Southeast Asian communities and I just remember all of the heads of the companies just being like we had no idea. And it was so shocking to them. First of all, that experience that we were both talking about, but also I remember specifically, you know, talking about um, being a transracial adoptee. And it was still such news to them that all of us transracial adoptees were not like super, it wasn't necessarily a, a net positive thing or that it wasn't this blessing or that we could even like have some misgivings about that experience or even like getting a little deeper about how our experience is tied to US militarism and Asia. I mean, we were just like blowing all their minds. So I think that that was really shocking to me because I thought, well, these are other Asian Americans. They should, they should know, right? They should know what we do and how were you, what, because we're all part of this supposed umbrella of this, this, this title, this blanket community. But that was really a, a eye-opening to me was to realize how much they didn't know about us. And then the other story I have is that, you know, in my day job, I, I worked for a foundation, but then I also was a fundraiser for a long time. And I remember talking to uh, a program officer from a, a large national foundation that shall not be named, um, that is in New York. And this person saying to me on this phone call, because we were talking about some of the ideas we had, they were like, are there people of color in Minnesota? And I was like, are you kidding me? You're supposed, again, you're supposed to know. Like, I thought that you were, you know, someone who's educated who understands, but it is still always shocking to me the, 
lack of awareness of, of who we are and, and this community and what our experiences are and even, and how important it is, right? And how it relates to everyone else's experiences, this, this broader um, narrative of, of, again, like things like US militarism in Asia or you know people of color, these broader movements, how we also contributed to those movements as well. Amazing. Yes, and that actually ties into the next question that I have, and this will be my last question before we open up to the audience. So folks here, like if you can start thinking about your questions, you can already start dropping them in the chat. Um, but I'm curious, as the young person here, um, even though I feel very wise still, and ex you know, lots of life has, I've lived a lot of lives already, but um, I am curious, like, do we, should we have another, like a second Asian American Renaissance? And are we already doing it? And if so, or if not, how do we do it? And what lessons would you take from uh, the, the first, first iteration of it to apply to how we move forward and, and continue to grow as, as artists and as a community? Um, I, I think we still need an organization like that. I think if we had a journal of the Asian American Renaissance, there'd be Asian American writers here. If we had classes in Asian American for Asian American writers, if we had speakers and activists come, there would be an audience for that. If we presented arts or uh, arts exhibitions, there would be an audience for that. So I think there is still an audience. And one of the things I would say is that we are different than the African American community. And one of the differences is that if you are an immigrant or your parents are an immigrant, are immigrants, um, the culture in your family is ethnic, it's national. Like if you're a Vietnamese immigrant or Hmong immigrant, your, your culture is Vietnamese or Hmong, right? And it's not Hmong American culture. It's not Vietnamese American culture, right? Your parents, if your parents immigrated to Vietnam, they don't, they didn't grow up with American culture. Whereas if you go to an American high school, and I always say, if you grew, go to an American high school, if you come here young enough to go to an American high school, you understand something about the way American works, right? That if you don't go to an American high school, you don't understand. And so you have this identity, which is both cultural, bicultural in some ways, and you're trying to negotiate between the values of your family's culture and the culture of America. But you also have this experience of being racialized, which is the experience of what is it like to have a body like mine and go out and interact with American society? How do other people interact with me? How do they view me? And then how does the culture and society view people like me? And then conversely, how does living in that culture, having these interactions affect the way I look at myself? And, you know, my, I'm a third generation Japanese Americans. My parents were imprisoned during World War II by the US government, you know, without a trial and no Japanese American was ever convicted of espionage and the government lied about, it. actually the FBI had determined that the Japanese Americans were not a military threat. Now, my parents never talked to me about that history, right? And so they didn't couch that in a way like an African-American would, like, you know, segregation. You know, here's what it's like for me to grow up in segregated Alabama and talking to the kids. Or again, this, this talk the African-Americans have, here, here is what happens when you interact with the police, right? Um, we don't necessarily get that and we don't see like if you're African-American, you see everything in African-American history and culture as part of your own. Whereas Asian-American is this weird, is this not, it, it is sort of weird. It, it, it's this unwieldy fiction, right? As Vietnam Win has said. But yet under that umbrella, we recognize similarities. And it allows us to talk about these experiences in ways that we can't anywhere else. And so Asian American art is essential to articulating who we are, to giving voice to our experiences, because if we can't do that, we can't tell people what our community needs. 
We can't tell people what we find upsetting or unjust about systems that we encounter, right? Because we can't, we, we don't have the language to do that. And this is what art provides. And that's why the Rena an organization like Renaissance and organizations like Theta Mu and Pangea are, 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 are still needed. That's, that's really interesting, David. I mean, so you kind of persuaded me a little bit because I was gonna to say to that, to your question, Julia, that I feel like first of all, that people are, forming their own organizations now. And I and I always hesitate as, an, as a baby elder to kind of prescribe what people should do. And I feel like people should be able to lead and do whatever they feel is right for the moment, right? And whatever they decide is what is right. You know, so organizations like like FOC or like, you know, WASHI or like, um, you know, even, even individual artists, you know, um, like Kali Tao. I mean, there's just so many great up and coming artists and they're forming their own spaces and, and doing their own thing. Um, so I, and I love that, right? Because I feel like that is the empowerment that they gained from, from whatever this thing was, this movement that the Renaissance kicked off. But I think there's something that you're saying there that's really interesting, which is um, I would love more spaces for us to connect across these, these ethnicities or these other boundaries within this Asian American uh, identity, you know, because we know in some ways it's a political um, identity, right? It's a political title in some ways. And I feel like I would love more opportunities, whatever that is, you know, maybe it is something like the Renaissance or it is, is um, conversations where we can continue to discover all the ways that we share um, some of the experiences and the points of view that we share across from Korean adoptees to a Hmong American to, you know, a Karen community, other communities that, that we haven't always had done the greatest job of like bringing into the space, but also that need again to find those shared um, uh, experiences and, and um, voices and needs and, and I, I'm, I'm babbling, but I mean, there's just something there that I think is really interesting about what you just said. Yeah, thank you for- Can, can I just add one more thing just yes, about this? Yes, please do. As an example, you know, part of the activism in this community, I just helped with Carolyn, who's head of more than a single story. We co-edited an anthology uh, we Are Meant to Rise, Voices for Justice from Minneapolis to the World. And it's an anthology of Minnesota BIPOC writers. Many of the essays are focused on the murder of George Floyd and the police demonstrations, also on the pandemic. But there's an essay by Kevin Yang who, who talks about, a Hmong writer who talks about, he was growing up, and uh, Marlene is holding up the anthology, he, who talks about how he, he, the school system in a certain way was tending to separate him from his Hmong friends. The teacher once said to him, you know, either you can sit with your Hmong friends or you can try to succeed academically and sit away from them, right? And so he was beginning to think there was something wrong with him being Hmong. And then he just happened to read, the teacher just happened to pass out a poem by a Hmong writer in his class. And suddenly he went, oh. And then a little later, there was a poem by Ed Bach Lee. And Kevin began, took Ed's poems and recited them in poetry contests throughout the state. And he said, the literature of reading that Hmong poet, reading Ed Buckley, it saved my life. And it brought me back to the Hmong community, right? And that's the power of the art. And yes, he was inspired by a Hmong American writer, but he was also inspired by a Korean American writer writing about uh, subjects which Asian Americans can all relate to. Thank you. Wow, I liked how controversial that question was. That's awesome. Yes, I think, um, I mean, as a, as a, independent artist who has had the opportunity to learn and, and work with Pangea World Theater and Ananya Dance Theater. And I'm now at the Coalition of Asian American Leaders and I'm working with the network of politicized adoptees. I mean, these are all things that have really been fueled by the Asian American Renaissance. And do we need something that looks exactly like the Asian American Renaissance did in the nineties? Maybe not, but I think that you're right. Like there's a lot of incredible work that's happening kind of in their own pockets and silos. And then how do we find these cross moments to 
collaborate and, and work together and and how do we build power together yeah right I, I think that that's the key that's a key question Julia because I'm very haunted this week and very disturbed by the recent mm. shootings in Dallas and Orange mm. County and you know it just comes down to when people are targeting us as a community they don't care what ethnicity you are right they see us as a monolith and so there, that there's something about that shared power question too that's built upon by those shared experiences and coming together as a community. Yeah, and unfortunately, we are regarded, I think, in many ways as almost permanently alien to American society, right? And so, you know, there's a rule for Asian Americans. Whenever there's trouble in Asia, it rebounds on us. And it doesn't matter what country that trouble comes from, if they're having trouble with America, or they're causing some controversy in America, it will rebound to all of us. But conversely, I think ironically, what this means is then if we band together, we are stronger. If we band together, we can help each other. If we band together, we can articulate and form a voice which can counteract this hatred, which can counteract and fight against um, the view of us as not American, as not part of this country. And we have to understand we've been part of this country a long time, and we have fought racism in this country for a long time. The largest lynching uh, in America was probably the lynching of 19 Chinese, and I think it was 1874 in California. And people don't even know about that, right? That was our version of Tulsa. Right. And while you may be Thai American or Vietnamese American, you know, these attacks have happened and Korean American have happened on all different Asian American ethnicities. And if we were just alone, then we just suffer this alone. And we don't need to suffer this alone. We don't need to fight this alone. We can fight this together. Thank you. On that note, I want to invite all of our guests here to turn on your cameras so we can see your faces, if you're comfortable. And I want to invite you to offer questions and reflections into the space. I know um, I'm aware of time as well, so we may have time for maybe four, I don't know three, <laughs> five questions, um, but I'd love to hear from folks. So if you're comfortable unmuting yourself, uh, feel free to. If you prefer to drop a, a question or a thought in the chat, please do so. Um, and we'll try to get to as many as we can um, tonight. So, yes. Hi, hello. <laughs> hello, hello. Um, I come from Paduan, Minneapolis. My name is Alan Neri Mom. My dad is the oldest Mr. Mom. <laughs> and we have we have a family of moms. And I like to say that we are easy peasy Cambodian French and easy. <laughs> because I'm Cambodian and Chinese and colonized by and family in France and whatnot. Anyways, thank you for having this because I definitely needed it. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, uh, Katie's poem. Yeah, that your poem basically is what I've been spewing pretty much almost every day throughout my whole life a lot. <laughs> and sometimes I get in trouble for just getting too angry. And yeah, I, I mean, even look at the shirt. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Because I am over, right? I am over the stuff that we've just been discussing. <laughs> but I want to keep this short because I'm really just exhausted. Um, I was on a, my softball team last night. Only BIPOC, only Asian, of course. I wore my Sakamoto jersey with my Mizuno glove. And then, uh, anyways, I'm just really tired of 
just the whole week. And anyway, thank you so much for having me. And David, I will definitely get in contact with you and talk about some organizations that I've been really striving. I'm an, see, I'm not a baby. I put the Asian in ancient. <laughs> We are ancient people, and yeah, I'm in 1983. I will be almost 40, but like growing up in the Renaissance, it was like everywhere I go, what are you? What are you? And then everybody, nobody knew what I was. Nobody even knew what Cambodia was. And then many 20 years later, um, I'll be 40 next year. And now the question is, how old are you? I don't believe you. I get carded everywhere. And then I go to the bar. You look like a sting. I love him, but I'm not sting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to keep it at that, but I will get a hold. Of yes. Thank you. We will, uh, yes, we can connect. Um, thank you so much yeah. for sharing. You can connect with me on Facebook. Also, I should mention the Mixed Blood is putting on Cambodian rock band. Is it uh, yeah. the 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 Mekong? What's the uh, what's their name again? Are they from LA? Like, based? well, this is a musical. It's a oh. musical based on it. Yeah, actually, yeah, Theater Mu and Theater uh, Jungle Theater. Yep. Jungle Theater. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Sorry, I got that wrong. <laughs> Maybe on the guest list. <laughs> okay, I'll mute. Oh. Marlena, raised Marlena her hand. has her hand up, yeah. Oh, I just wanted to share, like, I think <clears throat> the greatest impact that AR had was something that Valerie said. You know, I want to keep mentioning Valerie Lee's name because she likes to hide, but she needs to be very present in these discussions um, as founding executive director of AAR. And she, you know, she once said, you know, the reason we're putting this together is because if we just had to like protest every every time somebody died or, you know, um, another Miss Saigon production happened, if we just keep doing that, we're just gonna be very exhausted. And that's why we have to organize. And it took me a long time to realize what she really was saying, which was that AR was not just a one, one-time pop-up thing that it was trying to make systemic change and which is why there was such an impact that true like if we do if if we continue to just be reactive to things when things happen then a will be tired and secondly it doesn't stay but if we whether there was something to shout about or not whether there was anything to celebrate or not that we continued to push our presence. That's what AAR was trying to do. It was such a simple explanation, but it was very- yeah, I think that's true. I would also just sort of add as a side to that, and this is about the political nature of the artists here. We're the only Asian American community that got the presenting theater to apologize for presenting Miss Saigon and to promise never to bring it back. It took us three, three performances at the Guardway, three uh, absolutely neglect on their part of listening to the Asian American community. But by the third demonstration, 2013, we organized the Don't Buy Miss Saigon Coalition. And so many of the artists in that, people like Juliana Pegues and Bao Fi, you know, started out as arts activists in, you know, with the Renaissance. In fact, <laughs> uh, Bao and Juliana and Ed Bakli all met at what, our first Asian American reading. Um, so, and, and by 2013, we had, we were able to organize and had an infrastructure that the Ardway didn't really think we could muster. They, they did not know, they thought like, Oh yeah, the Asian American community, they're protesting, but we'll just ride this out, right? And they, what they discovered is they couldn't ride it out because we were very organized and we were working with other communities of color. We we're working with Panji, we we're working with Theater Move, we we're working with Ananya Dance Theater. And so the power of the community 
was something that they terribly underestimated and the righteousness of our community. And we, we brought to bear so much and all of this came out really of the spirit of the Renaissance. And I'm reminded of one of the early Renaissance uh, cabarets, which was just after one of these demonstrations. And during the intermission, the audience began to get up and speak about their experiences at the demonstration. And at a certain point, there seemed to be no distinction between monologues by the audience and what the, the, the performers were performing. It was all one great performance around the anti Miss Saigon uh, movement. And that to me was really one of those instances where the community rises up and every big, big and people discover their political voice, their artistic voice all through this activity. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Tree, which was, what does more proactive political responses over reactive postures or response look like? So, um, Tree, did you want to provide any more context for that? I was mostly uh, responding to what Marlena had said about, um, well, not, not responding, but just like kind of echoing what Marlena said about like, we are, even today, it's like, this tragedy happens, this injustice happens here, and there's not really like a curriculum or like a, how, how do you say it, um, inherited institutional knowledge passed forward from like an A, like uh, the likes of an AR to the young generation necessarily, the, 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 the latest generation to deal with the latest stuff. Um, I think I would like adjust my question to be more around like, so, you know, our generation ha is within a pandemic, we're in like one of the most, uh, ominous and kind of inevitably bone crushing economic spirals of, of <laughs> I don't know how much I'm like exas exasperate, um, exasperating or whatever the word being hyperbolic, but also I'm like saying a lot of needlessly big words. <laughs> um, we're just like in a really tough time, right? And I wonder what, what it looks like to, to not be in crisis mode or crisis level responses when it seems like everything's a like a fire and we need to put it out all the time, but we don't really have like the, we're not equipped with the kind of literacy around either politics or arts to, to kind of rally ourselves together. There are other questions I have, but I guess like what, <laughs> I don't know. That's I'm, I'll pause there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. what does it mean to be in constant crisis response mode? And that has been what the past few years has felt like a like hundred percent. It's like, I'm nervous to look at the news and open my screen and see what, what happened next. What do we respond to next? So how do, we, how do we keep creating in that and how do we keep taking care of ourselves and, and making sure that we have a, a sustainable structure for the work that we're doing so that we can keep doing it? Katie, I'll... sure, sure. I can, I can try. I mean, obviously, this is a, a really important, big question. Um, I think we have to start in the same way that the Renaissance started, right? Finding each other. We, the answers and the strength and the resilience to what Hannah was saying in the chat is in each other, is in the community. And it's so hard, you know. To Tree's point, we're coming out of this pandemic where we've been incredibly isolated from each other, and we're all. I know I'm navigating my own social anxieties, coming back together in spaces with folks. But then you realize that once you're in that space, it feels really, really good. You know, you forget like how much power we get from each other. And like David was saying, you know, the Renaissance theater Mu in the early days, all, I'm sure all of all artists, when we start coming together and creating work and just sharing ideas and talking through things, maybe. Um, you know, reading things together, that's the way, that's the way we start building these communities in a sustainable way that is not reactive, that's not always feeling like we're responding to crisis. And that's, I think, where we go back to that idea of sharing power and building power. Yeah, I think one of the ways we do this in a more permanent way is we create infrastructure, right? Cal is this huge infrastructure, this organization which has grown tremendously in, in five years, just it, uh, 
a tremendous tribute to all the effort by everybody involved in it, right? To have 5,000 members. So, you know, and Cal does all sorts of legislative work, all sorts of work with research, but it's also individuals. I was at a Cal luncheon where Marjorie Andreessen, who was part of the Don't Buy Miss Saigon Coalition and was head of the Cal board, she spoke about how she and her partner were walking through St. Louis Park where she lives and some group of white teenage boys came up to her and began making ching chong, you know, noises and things like that. And Margie said, you know, before Cal, I probably would have gone home and just cry and just kept it all to myself. And she said, after Cal, no, I called up the mayor of the town. I said, this happened to me. What is St. Louis Park going to do to address the racism in its midst? I called up my councilman and said, this happened to me. What is St. Louis Park going to do to confront the racism in its midst? And it was wonderful. It was her representative was actually at the luncheon, right? Because her representative listened to her, right? And so it is the power of us coming together and forming these organizations and being together that empowers all of us, right? And empowers us as a group, but it also empowers us individually. And, and, and the value of political activism is not just the immediate effect of whatever issue you're doing, say it be Miss Saigon or Asian hate crimes or, you know, disaggregating, you know, data in, in the legislature among the different Asian American groups. All of these are important, but it's also how the activism changes the individuals involved because we become less scared. We become more willing to speak out. We feel the power inside ourselves and in our community. And whatever the outcome of the particular protest, that protest sustains us in work that goes on further, right? And it goes beyond our lifetime. We are all inspired by the example of Yuri Kochiyama and Grace Lee Boggs, right? And so their work that they did lives on after them, right? So whatever work you do can move forward into the future, can sustain not only you, but other people. Can I add one thing to that too, that was David mentioned something that got me thinking about. Also, we have to demand as a community more support. So I'm part of this um, coalition of Asian American Pacific Islanders and philanthropy. They just released a report, a study, and one of the communities they're looking at is Minnesota because Minnesota has so much money. I mean, that is another thing that makes us unique from other areas of the country. We have a lot of philanthropic dollars here. And they did a study and they found that less than one half percent of uh, private philanthropic dollars went to Asian American AP, AAPI led organizations. I mean, we have to do better and we have to demand better because this money is not going to, into our community um, in the way that it should. Thank you. Um, that actually, this is a great place to wrap up. I want to be mindful of folks time and I, I want to thank you all for being here. Um, in, in this conversation that Katie brought up of resourcing our work and, and fueling ourselves and, and giving um, this month is Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And it also is um, a national month of giving to Asian orgs across the country. Um, and so Cal is one of those orgs. And so I do want to uh, let you know and invite you into our um, circle and invite you to uh, give a gift today. Um, we, we are doing, um, a, we're really grateful to more than a single story for being a part or helping come to us with this idea and bringing this event to life with us. And they're also being very generous in providing a, a matching donation for um, now through nine o'clock tonight, um, up to $500. So um, any gift amount really makes a huge difference for us to be continue doing this work and to, you know, in talking about sustainability, it takes resources and it takes money and it takes community like you to make it happen. So thank you. Um, and we've dropped uh, a link in the chat to our give um, MN or maybe we can maybe 
could we redrop it in the chat? It doesn't seem to have linked, but we can um, drop it in the chat again for you. Okay, so thank you all for- uh, well, So there's yeah. an evaluation form. Right. Uh, yes. There is an evaluation form. So there's a few housekeeping things before we wrap up. So um, uh, let's drop the evaluation form in the chat as well. Uh, we are always trying to improve our programming. And so we'd love to hear your feedback, um, how you thought tonight went and any thoughts you had. Um, and then I wanna do one final uh, push for the podcast, uh, which is uh, somewhat of my, my little baby as well, because I am the host and uh, really happy to have been a part of uh, bringing it to life. And I think that, so Cal has been doing these mini Asian stories, storytelling series for uh, five years now. And it first started as a, a story a day from community members that we shared through our uh, social media and website and email channels. Um, but I, I really wanted to bring it into something where we could really delve into the stories of the people we were talking to. And so podcast was one of them. And so I'm really happy to have Hannah Kinzer on this call because Hannah is our incredible mini Asian stories correspondent and has been uh, conducting a lot of the interviews for the podcast and giving a lot of her time to making it happen. So thank you, Hannah, for being here. Um, we have partnered with uh, The Uptake and WFNU Frogtown Community Radio to make the podcast happen. So you can check out the podcast. Kara just dropped the link in the chat. Uh, you can listen on Spotify. You can listen on Apple. You can listen on all your favorite podcast platforms. Uh, we also have it on our website. Um, so take a listen. Definitely check out David and Marlena's ep episodes. Um, those are season one, or no, season two, episode one and two. Um, yeah, so check that out. And we're just, we're talking about the Asian American Renaissance for those two, but then we go into exploring our fight for ethnic studies, our history of queer Asian organizing in the community, our, our history of uh, adoptee organizing in the community. Those are gonna come out in June. So I'm um, really excited about this podcast and continuing to do the work of archiving the work that we've done. So recognizing the contributions Asian Minnesotans have been doing for decades. So. Awesome. And I want to thank you all as well for joining us tonight. Thank you to David. Thank you to Katie, Carolyn, Mia. I, it looks like Carolyn wants to say something else. Um, I want to thank uh, the, sorry, I have a lot. It's like the Oscars. I'm getting pushed off <laughs> with music, but I want to thank Tara and Ryan and Mooks, who's not here tonight, um, but was a big part of making this happen as well. Everyone is amazing. I'm crying. I'm getting my Oscar. Okay, Carolyn, I'm going to pass it to you. Thank you all. <laughs> now that you have your Oscar, I just want to say thank you again to Cal, <clears throat> excuse me, to Julia, to Katie, to David, to Marlena, to Sherry, to everyone I know who's here tonight. Thank you so much for partnering with More Than a Single Story. This is the first in the Asian American uh, series of Embracing Our Roots. I think we're going to be doing another one in the fall, David, with Rick Shiomi, correct? Mm -hmm. And, uh, there, and there, well, I think it's going to be next year. Next year, okay. Yeah. Well, th there will be more. <laughs> and we also want to encourage you to, if you haven't seen um, our book that David and I edited, We Are Meant to Rise, that he mentioned earlier and that Mar Marlena showed that one. Yeah, if you don't have it, it's, it, it is a treasure. And just again, thank you all for being here tonight. And thank you, Nia and, and Ryan for doing all the behind the scenes work. <laughs>